welcome to North Point. Every Sunday is special around here, but today is extra special because we have our love feast right after our worship service this morning. The early church had love feasts, and we see the wisdom in that, bonding with one another over a meal, building our relationships, growing in love. So we invite everybody to stay. As was announced, we're close to Thanksgiving, so this will be our Thanksgiving love feast. We'll have turkey and dressing, sides and desserts, even ham. <laughs> so again, if you're a visitor or a member, we hope everybody sticks around, you'll have a great time. North Point is, to God's glory, a dynamic growing church. We got a lot going on. In fact, if you can't find something to do around here, you're not looking very hard. We stay busy. And because things are going so well and there's so much momentum, the elders have decided that it might be a good time to add to our team. Right now we have three elders and 11 deacons. And today we want to put up two men for elder and four men for deacon. The two men for elder, Tracy Waldridge and Caleb Ashby. These men love the Lord. They share our vision. They're willing to work. We think they'll be a great addition, so we're putting their names up for elder. The four men for deacon, Dalton Seeley, Colton Seeley, Scott Berry, and Josh Allen. If there are no scriptural objections, and I want to emphasize the word scriptural, if there are no scriptural objections, these men will be appointed in two weeks from today. I praise God for that. I'm excited about that. Amen. As the church grows... More and more men will need to be added, and I appreciate these men for stepping up. Amen. Can you pray with me? Father in heaven, we just bow before you in all of you, in all of your greatness, in all of your majesty, in all of your power. Father, thank you for blessing us as you have. We pray that you'll continue to give the increase to your glory. Father, bless our leadership, bless all those who serve in various capacities. We pray, Father, that we'll stay united in truth and in love and in our vision. Please bless us, Father. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How do you envision heaven? What will it be like? I think if we're being completely honest, most people have a pretty boring view of heaven. They picture heaven as a never-ending church service. Or people floating on clouds, strumming harps, or singing praises forever and ever and ever. I think a lot of times it looks something like this. <laughs> and we look at that and we think, yawn, that's pretty boring. And as a result, we're not very excited about heaven. I mean, it certainly beats the alternative. But if we're being honest, few of us are overjoyed about the idea... Of, a, of an everlasting sing-along in the sky. Well, if that's you, I've got good news. The biblical concept of heaven is much more appealing and far more exciting than our simplistic understanding tends to be. The Bible describes heaven as a place with beautiful scenery and bustling activity. It is a place where God and man and even predator and prey live together in perfect harmony. It is a place where righteousness dwells and there is no sadness or sorrow of any kind. Heaven is a place where the curse is reversed and the Garden of Eden is restored and enhanced. And it will be a lot closer to our current, current reality than many of us imagine. I think most of us, if you're a Christian... Most of us are very well, well aware of the fact that our current bodies will one day be raised up and transformed. At the second coming of Christ, there will be a physical resurrection of the dead. And our bodies, they will still be the same bodies, but our bodies will undergo a change, a transformation. That is a fundamental concept of Christianity. Yet sadly... Few of us realize that the same promise of renewal also pertains to the physical creation. Just as our old bodies will be made new, the old earth will be made new. Now that may surprise you, it may even shock you. 
But I think as we go along today, you'll see that this is the, the teaching of Scripture. I want to begin in Romans chapter 8. In Romans 8, beginning at verse 18, Paul wrote, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Let's break this down. I want you to notice there are two groups under consideration. The creation and the sons of God. The sons of God are Christians. Paul makes that very clear in verses 14 through 17. The sons of God are those led by the Spirit who've been adopted by God. It's a reference to us. He's referring to Christians. The creation refers to the material realm. The physical universe. And I want you to notice what he says about the creation. He says the creation waits with eager longing. Eager longing. We might say excited anticipation. The, the Greek word literally denotes standing on tiptoe. It, it's looking forward to something. It can hardly wait for something. Well, what is that something? The creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. That's a reference to the second coming. Now, wait a minute. If you were taught like I was taught, that doesn't make much sense. If you were taught like I was taught, the physical creation should not be yearning for the second coming. What is there to look forward to? I was taught that at the second coming, this creation's in for it. That this creation is going to be annihilated and will forever cease to exist. Not much to look forward to. And yet Paul says the creation waits with eager longing for that time. He'll explain why in a moment. Paul goes on to say, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Paul is saying that creation fell on our coattails. When man fell due to sin, creation fell with us. Creation suffered the consequences of the curse. It has been subjected to futility, corruption, death, and decay. We see it all around. We see it in the animal world. We see it in, in nature itself, the trees and the stars and the sky. And so Paul is saying, look, man is the one who was guilty. We're the ones who sinned. But this didn't just affect us. This affected the whole creation, not on its part, not willingly, but on our part. But notice this next line. In hope. What? The creation has hope? I was never taught that, were you? I was taught the creation has no hope. I was taught that the creation is doomed. It's done with. But Paul says the creation, though it was subjected to futility, though it suffers from the same curse, like man, it too has hope. In hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Notice that Paul parallels our hope to creation's hope. He says creation itself, the material realm, and in particular the earth, hopes to one day be set free from the bondage to corruption. It hopes to obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. 
And then Paul adds, the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Notice he doesn't say it's groaning with death pains. He says it's groaning with birth pains. That's a big difference. Birth pains hurt in the moment, right? But they give way to something better. Those birth pains eventually give way to deliverance. And Paul says not of man, but he says of creation. The whole creation has been groaning in the birth pains until now. I think this is very, very interesting. The Apostle Paul says that we, the sons of God, look forward to the second coming of Christ in hope. And so does creation itself. Why is the creation looking forward to the time when Christ returns? Again, notice, Paul said, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Albert Walters in his book, Creation Regained, says this. Speaking of God, he said, He refuses to abandon the work of his hands. In fact, he sacrifices his own son to save his original project. Humankind, which has botched its original mandate, and the whole creation along with it, is given another chance in Christ. The original good creation is to be restored. Now, if you were taught like I'm taught, there's some red flags going up. You might be a little taken aback by that. What? This creation has hope? This creation will be restored? That's what Paul is saying in Romans 8. He is saying creation is not longing for annihilation, but liberation. Now you might counter that by saying, well, what about 2 Peter 3? I'm glad you brought it up. Let's go there. In 2 Peter 3, Peter is talking about scoffers. The naysayers who mock and ridicule Jesus Christ. And notice what he said beginning in verse 3. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Peter said, let the scoffers scoff. They're ignorant. They don't know what they're talking about. They ask condescendingly, where is the promise of his coming? Nothing has changed. Nothing ever will change. Peter says they deliberately overlook this fact. The heavens that existed long ago and the earth with it was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. He's referring back to Genesis 1, right? He's referring back to creation. And using water, he says, And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. That's a reference to the flood, right? God brought a catastrophic flood upon the earth. It covered the entire earth. There was great devastation. In fact, you could say the earth was destroyed. But notice how he parallels... Destruction with water to destruction with fire. He says, but by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. This is real important. Follow Peter's logic. Peter says that back back in the day, 
God destroyed the world. How did he destroy it? With water. In fact, did you notice he used the term perished? God said the old earth perished. Does that mean it was annihilated? Does that mean it went out of existence? No. Even though it was destroyed, even though it perished, the earth still remained. But as the waters receded, a new creation emerged, didn't it? One that had been purged. And Peter likens that to the coming destruction of the world by fire. He purged the world with water in Noah's day. He's going to purge the world with fire when Jesus returns. But that does not mean the earth is going to cease to exist. We have assumed that. We have assumed that when Jesus comes back, he's going to burn up the world and it's just all going to go away forever. But I think it's interesting, Peter parallels both catastrophes. And you could say of each one, the earth was destroyed at that time. You might even say, as he did, the earth perished at that time. But as the waters receded, and as the smoke and ash begins to disappear, I'm getting attacked by a fly. <laughs> a new creation emerges. But keep reading, Aaron. Okay, let's do it. Skip down to verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of person ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens that will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? See, Aaron, there it is. There's going to be a fire that destroys everything. It's all going to be burned up and melt away and be dissolved. Let's look at it closely. He's referencing the day of the Lord. That's exactly what Paul was referencing in Romans 8 when he talked about the revealing of the sons of God. It's the second coming. And Peter says that when the day comes, it'll come like a thief, unexpectedly, without warning. And at that time, the heavens... That's the sky and everything beyond. The heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. So everything from the sky and beyond is going to be dissolved. He repeats that later on. The heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But what about the earth? He says the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. You might say my translation says destroyed. The old King James Version. There is a textual variant, but the strongest manuscript evidence supports this rendering. Not that it's going to be burned up and destroyed, as in annihilated, but the burning is going to be a purging. It's going to have a purifying effect where everything is exposed, that Greek word means to, to lay uncovered or to lay bare. And from that, from that fire, from that catastrophe, a new heavens and a new earth will emerge. How do you know? He says so in the very next verse. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Did Peter contradict Paul? Paul said the creation has hope. That it's longing for the same redemption that we're longing for. But Peter talks about all this fiery destruction. Just as the waters of Noah's day destroyed the world, and it perished in a sense, God's going to do the same thing with fire. But that does not mean the earth will cease to exist. In fact, I think it's interesting. He doesn't say a non-earth. He says a new 
earths. Why would he call it an earth if it's not going to be an earth? Since Peter brought up the new heavens and the new earth, let's just kind of chronologically go through biblical history. Genesis 1.1, the very first verse of your Bible, says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Right? He created the material universe. But by Genesis 3, man had sinned and the earth was subjected to a curse. Corruption, death, decay. So by the time we get to Isaiah, in Isaiah 65, 17, God promises, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. God says, sin has corrupted everything. It's tainted everything. So I'm going to create a new heavens and a new earth one day. As we come to the New Testament... 2 Peter 3.13, Peter says, But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So the promise was not yet fulfilled, right? Isaiah spoke of it. Peter speaks of it, but not in present tense, in future tense. That brings us finally to the last book of the Bible. Revelation 21.1. John was given a glimpse into... What's to come? He said, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. So God had created the first heavens and earth perfectly. He declared that it was good, yea, it was very good. But because of us, because of humanity, this earth was corrupted. No longer in its pristine state. But does that mean that God just waved the white flag on creation? Does that mean God said, oh, Satan, you got me there. I created this wonderful masterpiece, but you slipped in and you ruined it. I'm just going to have to wipe it out now. If you're like I was, that's pretty much what you believe. Yeah, because of our weaknesses, because we gave in to sin, God just kind of washed his hands of the creation. No, he hasn't given up. God has not decided to just wash his hands of this creation. God is in the renewal business. God is in the redeeming business. And that doesn't just apply to people. It applies to creation itself. Well, let's look at that Revelation 21 passage. The book of Revelation is admittedly difficult. There are lots of signs and symbols But as you come to the last part of the book of Revelation, John is shown the great judgment where Jesus will sit on his throne and he'll judge the world. And following the judgment scene, he's shown the new heavens and the new earth. We'll just read the first five verses. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God." He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. All right, let's notice this. John saw what? A new heaven and a new earth. This is post-second coming. This is post-final judgment. John gets a glimpse into what's to come, and he saw a new heaven and a new earth. Notice he says that the holy city, New Jerusalem. Now what is that? Heaven's capital city. He saw New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. 
Now that seems odd, right? Heaven's capital city comes down? I thought we went up. That's what I was always taught, right? We're going we're gonna to go up. But this says heaven comes down. He goes on to say, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Again, that seems opposite. I was always taught that the dwelling place of man is with God. He says he will dwell with them. No, that's reversed. I thought we were going to go dwell with him. I don't know how I missed it, but for a long time I did. The last word of Scripture is not us flying off to some spiritual disembodied state far away. The last scene of Scripture is God coming to us. And that's reminiscent of the garden, right? Before sin entered the world, God, God lived in the garden. He walked among the garden. He was there with man. And I think it's so cool, the Bible begins and ends with, with the garden. It begins with the Garden of Eden. It ends with the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was lost. The Garden of Eden will be restored and enhanced. There's more. Let's go to Matthew 19. In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus encounters a rich young ruler. He falls down at the Lord's feet and asks, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, You know the commandments. The young ruler replies, I know them and I've kept them from my youth. Jesus said, There's one thing you're lacking. Go and sell all your possessions, give it to the poor and follow me. Jesus detected a character flaw in this man. He was possessed by his possessions. And so Jesus said, go sacrifice those things. But he was unwilling to do so. The Bible says he went away sorrowful. Well, Peter saw that. And Peter said, Lord, we've given up everything. What are we going to get? I think it's so cool. Jesus did not rebuke Peter for asking that. Peter didn't say, or, or Jesus didn't say to Peter, Peter, you're so materialistic, you're so worldly, asking what you're going to get. No, Jesus was glad to answer. Notice Matthew 19, verses 27 and 28. Then Peter said in reply, See, we've left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne... You who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. What are you going to get for sacrificing, Peter? What are you going to get for giving up everything to follow me? You're going to get to reign with me in the new world. The new world. Interesting. It's the Greek word, palin Ganeasia. Palin Ganeasia, it's a compound word that literally means to birth again. It is defined as being rebirthed, recreated, regenerated. The ESV translates that the new world. The uh, complete Jewish Bible says in the regenerated world. The ISV says in the renewed creation. The NIV says at the renewal of all things. The NLT says, when the world is made new. And the NLV says, when all the earth will be new. That's what the word means. It's a, it's a recreation of something. Jesus is saying, in the recreated world, in the, in the renewed world, in the regenerated world, when this world is recreated, you're going to sit on thrones, Jesus said. Again, that doesn't mesh with what I've always been taught. This world's not going to be recreated. It's going to be wiped out. It's going to cease to exist. No, there's a clear thread through Scripture that God's not done with this creation yet. Yeah, it's going to undergo a purging by fire. No doubt about that. But the purging will not be the last word. 
From the ashes, a new creation will come. A new earth. One more passage in Acts chapter 3. Peter and John are going up into the temple to pray. They encounter a lame man begging for alms. They heal him miraculously. Well, as you might expect, that attracted a crowd. A lot of people noticed that. And so Peter uses this as an opportunity to preach. Notice what he said in his sermon, Acts 3, verses 19 through 21. He said, Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that He may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive Him until the time. Okay, this is the second coming. The time, as Paul said, when the sons of God will be revealed. The time that's going to come like a thief in the night, right? Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything. Amen. As he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Now if I were reading that, I would assume it says heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to destroy everything. Right? To annihilate everything. To wipe out everything. Not what Peter said. Peter said Jesus is coming back to restore everything. Now that might be challenging for you. It was challenging for me. This sermon has been months in the making. I have read, my eyes are probably still stunned from all the reading. Because this went against everything I'd ever believed. But I have to tell you, it's quite exciting. It makes heaven more appealing. We're not just going to be sitting on a cloud strumming a harp or singing praises forever and ever. No. The Garden of Eden is going to be restored. We're going to serve God. We're going to worship God. But we're going to live. There's still going to be relationships. I can't wait. Here's how other translations render that. Until the time comes for God to restore everything. The NCB says, until the time comes for the universal restoration. The NLT says, until the time for the final restoration of all things. And I really like the worldwide translation. It says, until the time when all things will be made new again. As they were at first. God, listen to me. God is in the redeeming business. Amen. He always has been. Not just true of us, but of his masterpiece and creation as well. Amen. If you were in Larry Morgan's Revelation class, he encouraged you to get the book Heaven by Randy Alcorn. It's a good book. Now, with every book by man, you eat the meat, leave the bones. But I began to read that book. I've read several other books and articles, watched a lot of podcasts on this topic. Wes McAdams, a gospel preacher, has some great podcasts on this. But Randy Alcorn is laying out these truths, and he makes this statement. He says, God has never given up on his original creation. Yet somehow, we've managed to overlook an entire biblical vocabulary that makes this point clear. Reconcile, redeem, restore, recover, return, renew, regenerate, resurrect. Each of these biblical words begins with the re prefix, suggesting a return to an original condition that was ruined or lost. That's true. Ever since the fall of man, when the earth was cursed, we have glimpses, a common thread that says, God ain't done yet. Things are going to get worse before they get better, but ultimately, even creation itself yearns with hope. Yeah. It longs for the time when it too will put off this corruption when it'll be set free from this bondage. It's groaning with birth pains. Yeah, it hurts now, 
But there's something better to come. So in closing, God did not abandon His original creation or relinquish it to the enemy. He always intended to reverse the curse and redeem everything affected by it. That's why the early Christians looked forward to living with God in a renewed body on a renewed earth. Amen. Somebody says, well, is that heaven? I mean, how does that, how does that correspond isn't heaven by definition anywhere God dwells? And Revelation 21 says that God's going to come down with that holy city, the new Jerusalem, and dwell among us. Where at? On the new earth. This separation is going to cease. There's going to be a reuniting. God's coming down to live with His people. I know you have questions. And because of that, we're going to have a question and answer session tonight at the PRP campus, if you'd like to come. I'll quickly recap some of these truths. I'll add a few more verses to it. And then we'll just open it up. Tracy Waldridge will serve as moderator. We'll just open it up. You're free to ask any question you want. I may not have all the answers. If I don't know, I'll tell you so. But this is pretty, pretty persuasive to me. Romans 8 says creation itself has hope. Peter said, yeah, it's going to undergo a fire, a catastrophe like that of the flood. But that doesn't mean annihilation. From the ashes will arise a new heaven and a new earth. We haven't even gotten into the Isaiah passages which depict what the new heaven and the new earth will be like. You may ask, will animals be on the new earth? Come tonight and I'll tell you. <laughs> Listen, to me, this is exciting. Amen. Amen. I've always kind of envisioned heaven as this far off place, this strictly spiritual realm with nothing to do but just constantly worship God. And if that's what heaven was, great, right? Amen. Praising God is, is great. But I missed it by a mile. He's going to restore and enhance what was lost when sin entered the world. And I can't wait for that. So again, I hope you'll come out tonight if you have any more questions. But what's the application of all this? What's the point? We skipped over that particular verse, but Peter makes the point that knowing these truths should prompt us to live a certain way. To live righteously in anticipation of what's to come. If you're not living for that, you'll never see that. Yes. So I encourage you, live every day for that day. If you're here and not a child of God, we never dismiss without offering the Lord's invitation, a time for you to come to Jesus Christ in humble obedience. Are you willing to repent of your sins, to confess your faith in Him, to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? If you'll take those simple steps, you'll rise up from that watery grave, born again, cleansed by the blood, and on the road that leads to heaven. That's where I want to be. On the road that leads to God forever and ever and ever. It starts with your obedience. Won't you come as we stand and sing?